Hey YouTube, I'm back with the Religious Studies. I am Kenyatta. We are going to continue on with, um, this will be part two of uh, Indigenous Religions, okay? All right, so I know, um, I, where did I end off? I think I'm talking about taboos. Yeah, taboo and sacrifice. Now we hear uh, shamanism, trance, and spiritual powers, okay? So we're just going to get right into it. I am off for the week for spring break, and um, I'm just here, happy to be off for the week. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. All right, a shaman, okay? Shamanism, trance, and spiritual powers. That's the title of this next section in indigenous religions. A shaman acts as an intermediary between the visible and ordinary world and the spiritual world, okay, and the spirit world. Again, we're talking about indigenous religions. They can contact the spirit world, uh, receive visions of it, transmit messages from it, and often help to help or heal others, okay? Uh, spirits may be reached in dreams or trances by climbing a sacred tree, okay, or climbing a mountain, okay, um, descending through a cave into the underworld, flying through the air, isn't that interesting, okay, or following a sacred map. The shaman can interpret the language of animals, charm them, and draw on their powers. <coughs> um, I remember um, growing up in uh, Church of God in Christ, Bishop C.H. Mason, there was a book about him. Was that a book or was that more oral tradition? Okay, I think it might be in one of their uh, publications, but he there was something going on in somewhere in the south. It was like a drought, and he, they called him down there, but there, and there was a dog. Okay, this dog kept howling and howling. Look, uh, in a town, I don't know if it was small, but I think it's probably a small town. Okay, and the people were irritated, you know, by this dog, and then there's a drought, so on and so forth. So they called him there. Okay, to see, you know, maybe to pray or whatever to help them through the situation. And um, he interpreted the dog's how. Okay, and I can't remember what the dog was saying. <laughs> okay, I don't remember. Okay, but whatever the dog had to tell the people. <laughs> okay, whatever he interpreted from the dog's how. Um, it was the answer to, you know, why they were having a drought. Okay, so Bishop Mason was able to tell them this is the situation. <laughs> Okay, and they, you know, listened and did whatever they needed to do, okay, and that ended the drought, all right, all right, now let's just keep on going, okay, and of course we hear about animal whispers and whatnot, inter being able to interpret, interpret the language of animals, all right, the shaman gains powers, gains the power of animals uh, by wearing items taken, taken from important anim animals, such as deer antlers, lion skins, and here we have eagle feathers. I take my hair down here. I get, my head is very sensitive. Like I, my sun sign is Aries and, um, you know, they have a lot of stuff going on. What, what it, the head, it rules. Okay. So a lot of times it's easy for me to get uh, headaches and all that kind of thing with, uh, hair being up, get, getting dizzy and whatnot. Okay. But anyway, let's just keep on going. All right. Part of becoming a shaman Okay, how do, in other words, how does one become a shaman? Here, part of becoming a shaman involves having one or more encounters with the spirit realm in the form of a psychological, a psychological death and rebirth. A person may have experienced some great loss. They might have lost their sight. They might have lost a child or something, you know, precious to them, equally as precious. He or she, okay, it's not just des designated to a he, but he or she may have a mental breakdown even. Okay, this is before they become a shaman, okay? This is an indication, these things that happen to them can be an indication to the community that, you know, this person is chosen, you know, for this role. They can have a mental breakdown, they can become terribly sick, suffer a serious accident, or have a near-death experience, all right? Once they recover from this extreme experience, okay, this extreme experience, experience this person have a new power. This person have, can have, excuse me, new powers of insight and healing, which can lead to becoming a shaman, which can lead to becoming a shaman. Um, there was a movie years ago about a woman. I saw this movie when I was young, young. I wasn't even a teenager. I was real young. And it's a true story. This woman was, I think she was in a car accident, but 
she almost died. She had a near-death experience. She ended up in a wheelchair. But after that, recovering from that experience, she had, I believe she had the gift of healing, okay? And she went around the world and was healing people, all right? Those who have experienced vivid dreams, and, and I can't even, I don't know the name of it or anything. I just remember images from the movie because I had seen it like a couple times. And I remember just being intrigued by it, all right? So I can't tell you the name of it. Those who have experienced vivid dreams and visions that are thought to be manifestations of the spirit world are also sometimes trained as shamans, okay? So even necessarily if you haven't had uh, an extreme, um, you know, this kind of extreme experience, uh, this negative type of experience, you know, if you have vivid dreams, visions, okay, of course, those are thought to be manifestations of the spirit world. The shaman often blends the role of priest. The shaman plays all of these roles, priest, oracle, psychologist, and doctor. Uh, what is a common English term for the name shaman? Medicine man. All right, we've heard that. Okay, but that term only stresses the therapeutic role and obscures the fact that shamans are both female and male. All right. Now look here, y'all. I got my drink. Okay, this is my drink with my um. Oh, you should see it. It's oh, it gets stiff because of the uh, uh sea moss. Okay. <laughs> mm. Basically, a smoothie. Okay. I don't care. That sea moss is strong, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to keep on taking it because that sea moss works. I'm hearing it flushes out most definitely, okay? Because after my first time drinking it, I was like, okay. <laughs> Next morning, I was in the bathroom. Um, I haven't had the um, reaction that I had before when I made a video about when I was making it, the first video I had when I was making it, that reaction I had, it was just like real bloated and itchy. I haven't had that at all with this. Okay. So anyway. And it's green because I put spirulina in, spirulina in it too. All right, but let's keep on going. Okay. Okay, now... In uh, places like Korean and um, Japan, the shamans are frequently female, more so than male. Okay. Um, well, I ain't going to say more so than male. I added that on there, but he did say frequently female, the author. The shamanic, the shamanic, the shamanic, excuse me, trance state, okay, that brings visions to the shaman and others can be induced in several ways. Okay. How can you come into this state of trance, uh, weakening visual boundaries? Okay, by like sitting in dark spaces for a prolonged period of time, fasting, experiencing sensory deprivation, all right, um, making regular rhythmic sounds such as drumming, rattling bell, ring, bell ringing, chanting, dancing in a repetitive way, especially in circles, all right. Uh, also, here, how else can they go in these trance states, Okay. The ingestion of natural substances is also common. Peyote, cactus, cactus, datura, cannabis or marijuana, coca, opium, and the mushroom, okay, Amanita muscaria, okay. These have all been used to induce trance states by the shaman alone and sometimes by participants in ceremony. Now, what's interesting about this, I had a, a journey with... Um, mushrooms for a year spiritual journey okay for those of you who are familiar um he is uh transition now but his name was um kalindi e okay he was known i mean he traveled everywhere you know doing conferences on mushrooms and the benefits of taking uh mushrooms um there is an author a white guy who wrote a lot about the benefits of taking mushrooms and his experiences. And I cannot remember his name off the top of my head right now, but is YouTube is, well, it was flooded with um, his lectures and whatnot. And if you Google Kalindi E Yi, K I L I N D I, and capital I Y I. Okay. Um, my friend, um, her name was, um, 
Kai Wingo. She had a mushroom farm here, okay? But I mean, all kind of mushrooms, okay? And that's how she got, she, she introduced me to uh, the mushroom for the spiritual experience, you know, not the party type of thing, you know what I'm saying, but for the spiritual aspect of it. And um, Kalindi E, he came, uh, well, when I met him, he came to teach us how to grow them. So I learned how to grow them. Um, I was in, they had a conference here in Cleveland. This, my, both of them have transitioned. Kalindi has transitioned and Kai has tra transitioned, okay? I had known Kai for years. Um, and, and she introduced me to into the journey and there's a specific way that you have to do it, you know, but I'm not going to go into all that here. But anyway, um, after her uh transition of maybe like maybe two years after maybe a year or two after I'm thinking at least two years after they did they had a conference here in Cleveland and I was able to speak at the conference on um, my particular uh, journey uh, and experience with it and what I obtained from it um, I believe in the one of the books that the, the white uh, man that I'm telling you about and I can't remember his name I'll see if I can find it um, hold on. Let me see if I can find his name real quick. All right. His name is Terrence McKenna. Okay. He was an American ethnobotanist. Okay. And mystic who advocated for the responsible use of naturally occurring psychedelic plants. Okay. So that uh, was my experience, the responsible use. <laughs> okay. Um, I would love to create to make some videos about my experience. I had another channel where I started to, but I didn't go into detail because for me, uh, some of it was, um, it just was too personal of an experience that I feel like some things don't, is not supposed to be shared, okay, you know, with um, anybody and damn sure not on the World Wide Web with the public. You know, that's how I felt at the time. I don't know. I might change my mind on it, okay, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, but anyway... Terrence McKenna. Now, he, there are some differences, I believe. Now, I, I started to read some of Terrence McKenna's work, but I, I just couldn't really flow with it after my personal experience. Not that I think that anything he said was wrong. Okay, some of it I did uh, listen to and read, but I didn't go into any great depth. Again, I study under uh, Kalindi E. And um, I think that um, the uh, personal experience uh, there was just some differences in how um, things were outlined, and especially in terms of race and culture, um, what they had found, what he had found, from my understanding now, Terrence McKenna, what he had found was a heroic dose was just like a starter dose for those who are melanated, okay, those in the black community. Uh, hero what, he, what he had found was, I, I, okay, I'm not sure I said that right. What Terrence McKenna found was a uh, yeah, heroic dose, which, you know, was like the pinnacle of doses. You can't go higher than this. <laughs> okay. It was like a starter dose, okay, for people, um, you know, for black folk, <laughs> you know. And I'm not just going to say for black folk. I'm just going to say for people who are melanated, okay. There were some differences in how... Uh, it, from what I understand, how um, each community was able to handle the dosage. But nevertheless, one thing that I do believe that was found, that Ter I, I think this was from Terrence McKenna, because Kai uh, had shared this with me, that sometimes um, that any in indigenous religions, in any indigenous cultures, the shaman would take in these substances. Okay, because we see like in indigenous cultures, we see uh, they have a lot of tribal markings and things on their body, piercings, so on and so forth. Okay, well, here in the West, we might just do it, you know, maybe uh, something, a word, you know, the child means something to them or something means something, and we just kind of place it on the body somewhere. Or I like that picture, that, that look good. You know, we put it on our body somewhere. Where in these indigenous cultures, when the shaman would take it in, he could see, like, the veil is lifted, okay? That's part of the, you know, the the experience. The veil is lifted, and you can see, you know, so they could see um, on a person's body, you know, where the markings were, okay? And knowing what they meant, and then they would, quote-unquote, like, tattoo the body based off of what was already there. Isn't that amazing? Okay. But anyway, we just going to keep on going. But these uh, substances, okay, entheogens, ethnobotanists, um, have been 
all used to induce trance states by the shaman alone and sometimes by the participants in the ceremony, okay? Because taking those substances helps you lift the veil, you know, go into the spiritual realm, okay? And bring back any necessary communication to the community, all right? I personally do not recommend it um, in terms of uh, the way that I feel that we in the West use it. Okay, um, if it's not used in, again, a responsible way, a, a controlled type of environment, responsible, just, okay, I just want to try to, I just, after my experience, um, I did it for about a year. Okay, a little, about, yeah, a year. I don't recommend that for everybody. And I mean, I did it with others. Okay, I mean, you have to do it by yourself. But I mean, there was a community here that I was involved with. Okay, there was also a community that I was involved with online on Facebook. Uh, it was called Women Women and Entheogens. I don't know if that group still exists. That's been a long time. But personally, I just, it ain't for everybody. Okay. But again, it in these indigenous communities, it wasn't even necessarily for everyone. Okay. Um, at least I believe that I'm understanding that right. All right. It was the shaman who ingested this. And here we say the shaman alone and sometimes by participants in the ceremony. Okay. But we're just going to keep on going. All right. Spiritual powers and trans states are believed to make it possible to look into the past and into the future. This is called divination. Okay. Looking into the past and into the future. All right. From the Latin divus or God, and divinaire to foretell, all right? Looking into the past is thought to help determine the causes of illness, misfortune, okay? While looking into the future can guide an individual to act wisely, all right? And we understand that, you know, with those who practice divination. <clears throat> A diviner looks for causes of sickness. They look for causes of depression. They look for causes of death and other difficulties. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> What does a healer do? A healer works with a person afflicted with physical or mental illness to find a cure. Okay. A rainmaker ends drought. Malevolent sorcerers manipulate objects to cause damage. A rainmaker. Okay. All right. Um, malevolent sorcerers manipulate. Okay. There we go. Malevolent sorcerers uh, manipulate objects to cause them. So they even have their place. Okay. Everybody and everything, you know, good, bad, black, white, up, down, however you want to look at it. All right. Has its place. All right. Here, they may take the fingernails, hair, clothes, or other possessions of the victim, burn them or damage them or bury an object in the victim's path in order to cause harm. Okay. Witches need only use their spiritual powers. Okay. All right. Um... Okay, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit too. Okay, artifacts and artistic expression in indigenous religions. Let me, I just want to say this real quick too. When we talk about these things that I talk about, these entheogens, mushrooms, cocoa, opium, peyote, cactus, so on and so forth. You know, th there's uh, another book I have. Um, what is it called? The Great Cosmic Mother that goes, you know, so it's talking about these, you know, indigenous uh, communities. And it goes into the use of that. This is not something to be used just that it, as, as a drug. I know people look at it like, oh, that's a drug, you know, but they don't consider the sugar and the caffeine and the nicotine and so on and so forth as a drug. All right. Um, these things are, again, natural substances. OK, and I'm not saying just because it's a natural substance, you should just go ahead and indulge and everybody should just indulge in everything. No, I just laid out that, you know, this is for a specific purpose. Okay, uh, in these indigenous cultures and religions used by that that has been chosen to uh, play a pivotal role in a com in the community. Okay, and it has a specific purpose, not drugs, street drugs. Okay, all right. I'm just want to make that clear. Okay, and just to be you know a damn fool. All right, um, but it does talk about that in the Great Cosmic Mother that you do find that in societies such as in the West, where um, the use of these type natural substances, you know, are prohibited. All right, and looked down upon that. Uh, you know, people go indulge, okay, because that's just part of the human experience, all right? I don't know if that's part of the human experience just to help us endure the shit that we have to endure in this, um, you know, being in, from a religious perspective, being disconnected from source and the divine and from one another, okay, in a sense, or if it's just a part of just the human experience. I'm not quite sure. And I, I read it in the book. I don't, I didn't plan on even talking about it. So I can't tell you exactly.
exactly where it is because that's a thick book. <laughs> okay. I know I underlined it, but I can't tell you exactly what chapter it is or what page it's on. But if I find it, if I happen to pick up the book, because I'm not going to go purposely pick it up, although I might, now that I'm thinking about it, because I feel like if I introduce it to you, then I'm responsible for sharing it with you. So if I happen to pick up the book and um, I'll, I'll look for it and find it and maybe share it in the next video. OK, but I'm not going to stop now because I know it may take me a minute to find it. But it was talking about the benefits, you know, of these things, because people are going to indulge in something. OK, that's that's what we're going to do. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and I feel like to think, to feel and think that human beings should not is just absolutely ridiculous. Now, when I say that I'm not talking about drugs and street drugs and alcohol and things that are going to hurt and harm, you know, everything in moderation, okay, according to uh, the scriptures. But what I am saying is people are going to find some kind of way to indulge in something. Ain't going to be no crisp, plain, perfect. I don't indulge in anything. Whether that be the television, whether that, like I said, sugar, food, uh, shopping, spending money, um, taking in, you know, substances, uh, mind altering substances or shit, health altering substances. Okay. You, we, it's just a part of our, our humanity. Okay. But when it is, uh, distorted and it is made set in a place for, you know, like we do in the West, like prohibited, like it's this bad, terrible, evil thing, then no, you know, then people are going to indulge Okay, but not in a healthy, responsible way. All right, especially when there's no respect here for, um, well, we're just going to keep on going. I just say that much because I don't want to say too much and I'd be wrong. All right, so let's just keep on going. Artifacts and artistic. So sometimes we just need to have understanding of, of, of things. All right, artifacts and artistic expression in indigenous religions the masks, drums, statues, rattles, and other objects that are important in native religions were once seen as curiosities to be collected and housed in anthropo anthro anthropological museums. Okay. Today we see these differently. Their, their importance to the cultures that produce them um, and their inherent artistic value must be respected. They need to be respected. Like when I went to Egypt and we went to the uh, Cairo Museum, I mean, I was disgusted, you know, more than anything. OK, because here we have these beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, things that were created and built and statues and so on and so forth. It's just sitting there and I'm like, who goes into a whole, a per another person's land and just dis decimates and destroys, you know, things that are important to them and set up for with a, a real purpose in mind, you know, not for you just to take and just throw up in some building somewhere in some museum somewhere, you know, as though you have the right here. Come, you know, look at the shit that we collected from our uh you know, um, destruction <laughs> to, to dominate, okay, from our domination. But anyway, let's keep on. These things are to be respected, all right, because they were important to the culture that produced them, all right? They had a meaning. They had a function, okay? They meant something, all right? All right. Um, let me see. I'll just say this real quick, real quick. Although modern secular culture or Western culture, that's what, he, what he's saying in this book, does not usually think of dance or tattoo or body painting as religious expression. In many native religions, these art forms all fulfill that role. OK, part of the religious expression and understand, again, if you're not sure what religion is or you you just catching this video and you haven't paid, you know, you haven't looked at the series. Go back to the first uh, video to understand what religion truly is, not this stuff that people just throwing around um, talking about their particular religion or the particular, maybe even just the church or the mosque or whatever that they was raised in. No. It is is beyond that. OK, so go back to that first video to have an understanding in religions that do not rely on the written word or oral tradition. Artistic expressions take on unique significance because they are filled with meaning and remind practitioners of the specifics of the oral tradition. Dance takes on importance in native religions. I don't want to say native in indigenous religions. They incorporate religious objects such as carved and painted masks, headdresses, costumes, ornaments, and musical instruments. You know, we take these things, you know, we go on these journeys and whatnot, we find these things that they sell in somewhere, you know, capitalism, and we take it and put it, up, put it up on our wall without any thought about, you know, what it meant, where it came from, uh, you know, or e even if they're just copies, you know, what it meant, where it came from, what it was all about, what its function was, what relevance did it have to that community, what re religious or uh, spiritual, um, you know, uh, 
uh, background did it come from, all right? Um, in native religions, the ancient hula or the hula kahiko is danced in conjunction, in conjunction with chanting to honor the gods, Okay, so you know, we see that. I mean, rest kids, you know, we used to watch TV and they had, you know, the hula dances on there and we hula dancing and whatnot, but with no understanding, of course, children, but even just in general, with no, no, there was no one there to tell us either, you know, what it was, what it meant, what it was all about, why, why they were doing it, what each movement meant to what, you know, and to what various God, you know, how that particular move was honorable to that particular God or whatever the case may be, and the fact that they were chanting to, to honor the gods, all right? All right. Um, not something just for uh, for our entertainment. OK, it's not to be disrespected. Instruments for marking rhythm and lay wreaths of flowers or other plants worn around the head, wrist and ankles. OK, are considered religious objects. OK, which is interesting because, you know, I, mean, I was 14 years old. We went to Hawaii. You know, we got us some lays and you put it around your neck. They didn't tell us anything, of course, you know, but that that they were considered religious objects. OK, um, didn't really expect them to because here we have, you know, capitalism and y'all just coming to visit and look around and say, ooh and ah, you know, as though it's just some kind of resort. OK, without any that's, you know, can, that's the Western attitude without any respect to what this is and what this means and what this is all about and how it is significant to our culture. Now, y'all just come on through and just, you know, go to the beach and have a good time and put on the lay as though it means nothing. OK, what does that mean? What is that? What is that from? What is that all about? I don't know. It's just. The flowers they put around their neck. No, absolutely not. All right. Let's continue on. Chants are essential. They repeat the sacred words and recreate the stories of the religious traditions. Okay. We talked about the, the, recre the recreation of the myth in the religious traditions. Okay. Chanters. Okay, must not only have prodigious memories, but they must be able to recall thousands of chants. Okay, we're talking about oral tradition here. Okay, so that tells you right there what the mind is capable of doing and what it can hold. All right, and especially when it has importance and relevance to you and your community. They must also be able to create, create special variations on traditional chants and oral texts, okay, for individual occasions. Masks play a significant role in Native religions, especially when used in dance. When a dancer is wearing a mask and any costume, any accompanying, accompanying costume, the spirit is not re merely represented by the masked dancer. The dancer actually becomes the spirit. Now, check that out. Okay, it's not just you representing the spirit. Okay, the dancer becomes the spirit. All right, embodied on earth with the spirit's power. That's that's powerful to me. Okay, that just kind of makes me think of the Eucharist or communion, like in some. Uh, and we'll go into that definitely when we get into Christianity. But in some uh, uh, um, branches, okay, of Christianity, the body and bread, the Eucharist, is just representative, whereas in some, no, it is believed that that bread and that little cup of wine or that crack or whatever actually becomes the true body and blood of Christ, all right? All right, let's keep going here. The most famous of all wood carvings, okay, other forms of wood car carvings manifest uh, religious inspiration. The most famous of all wood carvings is the carved pole, or what is that? The totem pole, okay? Where this is found in the Pacific Northwest, the totem pole depicts several totems stacked one upon the other. A totem is an animal figure, such as the bear, beaver, thunderbird, owl, raven, and eagle, that is revered for both its symbolic meaning and its class symbolism. The totem animals may be memorials to ancestors or represent badges of kinship groups, okay? Or like people say, you know, they 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 tribe, they soul tribe, all right? With specialized meaning for the individual or for the family responsible for the totem pole. Other important art forms that have religious meaning Weaving, beading, and bas basketry, okay? Not just something, you know, just some inanimate object to put our stuff in. No, okay? Then patterns on there, on that, however they weaved it, and the patterns and the colors and all of that stuff. Everything here has some religious meaning, some symbolic meaning, religious meaning, all right? So let's look back. Like I said, going back, if you haven't watched it to the first video, to find out what does what is religion, what does it mean, 
All right. Not your religion, not your faith. Okay. Not your little experience. Okay. With one particular religion or at grandma's church. Okay. No, that's not it. It goes beyond that. It is all of this stuff is intertwined. Okay. The religious aspect, the cultural aspect. Um, oh, we're reading um, the ISIS papers, me and Sun Kiss. She lays it out. All of it is intertwined and basically one and the same. There is no separation. Okay. I know that's what they teach us here in America, <laughs> you know, in the West. But it's not, okay? That's part of the trickery, if you ask me, the mind game, all right, for you to make you think that it is, and in actuality, it's not. So when you think that you're not practicing something, okay, that uh, may be a part of a religion or the dominant religion of that culture, you think you're not practicing it, you absolutely are, okay? Why? Because it is, it, it is interwoven in all other aspects of the society. That's how a society works. That's how it runs, okay? Ain't no separation, all right? Let's keep on going. These creations may seem to have less obvious religious significance to who? To an outsider, all right? But the imagery used is frequently religious uh, derivation, particularly figures from tribal myths, nature deities, guardian birds, and animals. Feathers and feather work, okay, also feature prominently in many native uh, and many indigenous religions because of their powerful association with flight. Remember, they talked about the shaman in flight, okay, being in flight and contact with the world above. He goes into the cave to the underworld and he flies, all right, don't ask me how, I don't know, okay, but we see that imagery about the witch on the, uh, the w w woman on the broom that we call the witch as a little truth to everything, okay, if not total truth to it, then, you know, we our minds been saying minute and divide it up. Okay, that's part of that trickery, but we're just going to keep on going. Okay, so in the cave below the contact the underworld and in the in flight with the world above and beyond our own, all right? Some cultures associate certain birds with spiritual or protective powers. Birds are believed to have delivered songs, dances, rituals, and sacred messages to humankind. Right? You got feathers worn in the hair, blowing the wind and evoke birds in flight. Okay, followers of the ghost dance religion of the late 19th centuries, birds, birds become important symbols of rebirth. All right, we'll keep on going. The symbols that appear in myths and in dreams are the basic vocabulary of indigenous religious art. Common symbols include, once again, this mountain, Great Mountain, located where? At the center of the universe. So I would stand, it would stand to reason that probably any, um, I would think, you know, I could be wrong, but this is my thinking, that any culture, okay, any, you know, uh, these uh, indigenous religions uh, will possibly look at their, you know, sacred site, for example, as the center of the universe. Is there anything about yours? <laughs> anything about yours? You understand what I'm saying? They focused on theirs. Okay. Not that they thinking theirs is better than the next man's. It ain't got nothing to do with nobody else. It's just, that's a West, that whole mentality right there is Western, okay? And catch us, catch up with us on the ICE papers on Sunkiss channel and you will find out why that is, all right? But nevertheless, all right, no. So it would stand to reason that they would think that, the, you know, that secret site that, you know, is the center of the universe. And in a sense, it is, it is the center of their universe, all right? The tree of life. <laughs> The sun and moon, fire, rain, lightning, a bird or wings, death's head and skeleton, a cross and a circle. These, Im now think about those images, these common symbols that we see all the time. It'll make you look at a shit a whole lot differently. It can open your eyes, okay? You know, when you go in these malls and these stores and whatnot and you see this imagery on stuff, do not, do not think that just because it is, you know, Western or from a Western company, Western uh uh, ideology or whatnot that these things are we are not uh, these things these symbols wherever they came from and whatever they mean are not that that's not the intention of that decoration on that particular outfit uh, clothing movie book whatever in the hell all right especially with this supposed to be being a melting pot but and, and some other things okay but we'll get off into that as we move on um, later, much later, all right? Um, 
These images appear in, often appear in unusual forms. For example, lightning may be represented by zigzag. We know that when we see zigzag, that represents lightning, okay? The sun may appear like a swastika, okay? Don't nobody clutch their pearls because I said swastika, okay? We're going to get into that for those of you who are not familiar and only know it from the uh, use uh, being used by... Um, Um, you know, Hitler and his regime, all right? Because um, that ain't the first. They didn't originate that, okay? And it doesn't, for those who don't know that, it doesn't mean what, you know, we had thought it meant, all right? And the tree of life may look like a ladder, okay? Um, colors are, are also important here. Colors are universally used with symbolic meaning, also, although the exact meaning differs from culture to culture. All right, all right. Man, let's keep on going. Let's see what we got here. Okay, oh, we're almost done. Moving on. I'm going to finish this. If I get time today, I'm going to go ahead, because I think the next one is in Hinduism. If I get time, it ain't going to be on this video for sure, but if I get time today, I'll go into Hinduism. All right, I love them. All right, Indi indigenous religions today okay, show signs, many signs of vitality. Okay, some are spreading and it, even adapting themselves to what? Urban life, where? In the West. He ain't got to say it here, okay? For example, religions of the Yoruba tradition are not only practiced in Western Africa, their place of origin, but also Brazil, the Caribbean, and they are growing in cities of North America. We know that, okay? All right? Um, awareness of the indigenous religions are becoming widespread. Respect for them is taking many shapes. We can see a growth in governmental protection of the rights of indigenous peoples, okay? Indigenous peoples themselves are often taking political action. Why? To preserve their culture. Okay. People want to preserve their culture. They want to preserve who they are, where they came from, what they're about. Okay. I just find, I personally feel like that's like the natural order of things. Okay. That people just, that's just something that we want to do. Hell, we want to preserve grandma's uh, a recipe for her great sweet potato pie. Okay. That shit is important to us. Okay. So much so we ain't gonna let nobody else know about that shit. OK, we preserve, we would like to preserve our family name. We hear a lot of people talking about their bloodline, and how great and important their bloodline is. It is pr preservation. OK, and and community. I belong to this group. OK, I belong to this particular bloodline. I belong to this woman who made this awesome ass sweet potato pie. And I'm not going to let this shit out to nobody else. Only my family, only our family, our bloodline has ties to this and knows about this. OK, community. OK, culture, who we are. Preser preservation of culture is preservation of religion or preservation of religion is preservation of culture. And which is what? Preservation of self. Uh, survival. OK, making a mark. On the world, leaving our mark here. Okay, all right. In many places, a renaissance of indigenous cultures is underway. All right, let's keep on going. In some places, however, indigenous religions appear fragile. There are four principal threats to their existence. Let's look at the four principal threats. Now, mind you, I am reading out of uh, the fifth edition. I'm a, I'm going to be fair and say. Give you the date. Okay, you can see my book is falling apart. Okay, copyright 2010. So it's been a while. <laughs> All right. I thought I had the, because they had sent me when I was a professor, you know, they send you all kind of textbooks to use. All right. Uh, but this was the one that the school wanted me to use. Uh, they had sent me an updated version, but it. I looked through it. I'm like, it was the same thing. Sometimes these updated versions, I mean, they be the same thing, you know. I'm not saying all the time. It might be a paragraph or two that's different or whatever. Maybe a, 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 the word uh instead of the or something like that. But I didn't find anything any different, all right? So, But I want to be fair, okay? So, in some places, indigenous religions appear fragile. There are four, and it really don't make a difference, okay? The, the, the information still stands, all right? It damn sure ain't changed that much. The four principal threats the, to their existence. What is one? The global spread of popular culture. What is he saying? The global spread of Western culture, okay? 
our culture here in the in the in the states, Western culture. So go, please go over there and listen to uh, me and Sunkiss read the ISIS papers, especially not last night. I think we did chapter nine. I think chapter eight, maybe seven. Uh, I mean, uh, seven or eight, this came up, okay? But listen to that to find out what Western culture actually is. What is it meant when it is said Western culture? We are talking about uh, white culture, okay? Now, I'm saying that to say, ain't no need of nobody thinking that, okay, I don't need this culture, I don't need that culture, we don't need this particular culture, or, or people feeling like, you know, I don't need my... Uh, people's way of being in their culture and language because once you get a, rid of one you are naturally going to become a part of another okay there's no such thing as not a, a culture uh, you know being anywhere where there's no culture Culture, your way of thinking the way you, how you see the world your world view okay is no such thing so when he says the global spread of popular culture basically what he is saying is these indigenous religions are coming becoming fragile not as important to people they're letting their traditional ways of being go in the world they, they are forsaking it for what to take on another person's culture and this is what we find that happens okay historically we can find that okay Okay, so we're going to take out popular culture and put Western culture because that's what it is. Okay, and I'm not saying all of the only thing about Western culture is pop culture. No, but where does this popular culture come from? Where does it come from? It just don't come from up out of the blue. From where? Whose way, of, whose way of being is it? Whose thought process is it? Who came up with it? Who designed it? What group? All right. <laughs> Loss of natural environments, which goes back to this global spread of popular culture slash Western culture. Okay, because that part of that culture is uh, they go in and they tear down shit everywhere to build what they want, which is what whatever is a uh, part or conducive to um, or uh, equal to their culture, Western culture. Okay, so loss of natural environments. We see this historically in the United States. This shit didn't always look like this. Okay. Loss of traditional languages, which goes back to what? The very first thing he said, the global spread of popular slash Western culture. Tra loss of traditional languages for what language? And where does that language stem from? Okay. And conversion to other religions, which kind of goes back to the first thing, the global spread of popular slash Western culture. Not in totality. Okay, for that last one, conversion to other religions. All right, let's keep on. Television, radio, films, airplanes, and the internet are carrying modern urban culture to all corners of the earth, are carrying Western culture. Okay. So when you hear these words, you know what's being said. <laughs> okay, to all corners of the earth. Okay, you can see the change in some places in the way that people dress. Traditional clothing begins to disappear. And here, finally, he says it, as Western styles become the standard. That's a problem. Okay? That's a problem. And you may say, well, why, Kenyatta, why is that a problem? Because you're talking about the global domination of one particular culture, which goes to that one world order stuff people are scared of that they claim that they're scared of and that it's going to be so dangerous to us and so on and so forth. Then if it is, then have an understanding of what it is that that is happening in your world, in your realm, and the rest the rest of the earth to know that, oh, that's what that means. That's, that's a part of that. Exactly. Okay? Here it goes. Western, now he's saying it. Western businesswear is now worn in all the world cities and in formal clothing, baseball caps, t-shirts is seen everywhere. That ain't just, oh, that's just the way of, that's just the way of a dress. It is just the way of a dress. Whose dress? Okay. What culture? Okay. Why, uh, why is it being allowed one particular culture to be the standard and, and for people worldwide to feel that they should forsake their own culture for another. Sometimes we are forsaking uh, our own culture and don't know we we're, we're forsaking it for another. Yes, you are. There's no emptiness here. And just that's just the way it is. It, it is just the way it is for a culture, for a particular culture. Okay, that is 
Western. All right? Now you have some cultures who are trying to hold on to their traditional clothing, especially for formal occasions. You may find this Korea, Philippines, Japan. Architecture, too, is becoming standardized. Even architecture. Basically, there's nothing done in your culture. I think this is the right terminology in a vacuum. That nothing. It all stems every single aspect of it from the root to the to the from the top to the bottom and everything in between. Okay? <clears throat> and everything in between. All right. All right. Architecture, too, is becoming standardized as the international style with its plate glass, aluminum, and concrete, okay? This takes the place of traditional styles. In other words, international style, this Western style, is, Western culture is taking over the world, basically, is what this man is saying, okay? As modern, urban culture, as modern urban culture spreads across the earth, it tends to dominate... I just said it. It tends to dominate everyone's world view. It dominates. This is what I'm saying. So we better have an understanding of what religion is and how religion and culture are intrinsically tied. Intrinsically, they are not separate from one another. They are one and the same. We better know what's happening. Better have some kind of understanding. Okay. And not think that well, I, I'm not religious because I, you know, no, you, 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 you will practice things that are a part of your culture, really, that are religious in nature. Religion don't necessarily have nothing to do with a particular God. We already went over that. It doesn't have necessarily have anything to do with, well, I don't go to church. That's not it. That is not what religion is. Okay, it is an, another aspect, just like we talked about. Um, oh, shit. Here, hold on. Let me go get the book. All right. All human activity, in all areas of human activity, okay? Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, war, okay? Medical industry, all of it. I remember the last word I said, but, I, you know, I know I said I was. That is the, it, it's so what you think again, you're not practicing a particular religion, a way of life, a way of being. You absolutely are. Okay. Because it is the culture. They are intrinsically tied. And if you was raised in that culture, okay, you may not realize it. It may not be something they teach in churches, you know. You don't have to be, because that's not what it is. It goes beyond that. It's deeper than that, is what I'm saying. Okay. So see, notice how he ain't just talking about religion here. He's talking about culture as well. Because once again, they're intrinsically tied. They're one and the same. All of it's tied. The economics, the education, the law, sex, marriage. Okay. All of these institutions, labor, entertainment, economics. They're all they have to be. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They have to be tied so that your culture, your way of being, your life, your worldview, so on and so forth, can continue to perpetuate and exist. Okay, And that is the belief system. And the belief system goes far beyond just religion. Okay? What you believe. Okay? About your life, your worldview, about what life should be, so on and so forth. Okay? But let's just keep on going. Okay? Now, this is interesting, okay? So I'm going to read that again. As modern urban culture spreads across the earth, it tends to dominate everyone's what? World view. Okay? All right. Everywhere we go, what do we find? Hamburgers, pizza, rap, rock, jeans, Western culture. Things that grew out of the West. Some even believe that what popular culture is becoming a religion of its own, displacing all others, popular culture, which is, as I said earlier, a part of Western culture or a branch of Western culture. Because we, we have many branches and many, many cultures under the larger culture, okay? Um, 
hip hop culture as an, an, an aspect of pop culture. Now, you know, I came up in, uh, I was born in 72. So, you know, I was in college in the early nineties. Yeah. So, you know, hip hop was really big and I can't remember if there was somebody, it wasn't just a style of music or a genre of music that it was a way of life, a way of being. Absolutely. That's what culture is. Okay. Um, and I want to say somebody, they had some kind of book that almost looked like a Bible about hip-hop culture. But see, I'm not that familiar because I wasn't that into it. So if somebody knows about it, okay, drop it in the links, all right? I mean, not the link. Drop it in the comment below. Okay. Another great threat to indigenous religions is their loss of traditional lands and natural environment. Why? Because so much personal and group meaning comes from the natural environment, its degradation or loss can be devastating to a people's identity, to indigenous people's identity, to any people's identity. Okay. You know, a, a house, just think about it. Okay. Grandma's house and them, you know, they own the house. They left it for you all or, or whatever. And then maybe people let it go or they have to tear it down. That's... It, it does something to you emotionally, okay? It's heartbreaking. Her, I just went through that personally, myself, okay? To see that the house that I was raised in, that my uncles were raised in, so on and so forth, that I raised my child in was just sold off like it was just nothing, okay? Just for money, okay? That was heartbreaking because so much of my identity and my family's identity went into that building, okay, where we congregated and we gathered together ever since I can remember. I got uh, pictures of me as an infant in that home or um, as a small child in that home, growing up in that home, the memories, so on and so forth. It's the same thing. It is your home, okay? All right. A third threat is the loss of native languages. We talked about that. It has been estimated that approximately approximately 6,000 languages that are spoken in the world today in 100 years, only 3,000 will remain. Okay. Mm. In the U.S. and Canada, only about 500,000 indigenous people still speak their native languages. It might be less today. I mean, what is this? It was 2010. It's 2022. So what is that? To uh, 11... I mean, 12, uh, is that right? Yeah, 12 years later. I don't know. Um, let's see. Let me see. I'm going to read this. Uh, a single example of this phenomenon is the Kwakitol Kwakwaka. Wakwa, <laughs> okay, it's hard to pronounce, of British Columbia, okay? Although their population has been rising and is now as high as 5,000, only about 250 people speak the native language. Clearly, the loss of a native language or indigenous language endanger, endangers the continued transmission of a religion that expresses itself in that language, or of, in other words, the culture that expresses itself in that language, okay? A fourth threat is the spread of... It's proselytizing religions, okay, particularly Christianity and Islam, okay. I don't know Islam to be a proselytizing religion. I could be wrong about that, though. I mean, I know in its origin, in its, uh, you know, its spread, I guess you could say it was a proselytizing religion, but I don't know about now. That has not been my personal experience, and I have not known, but just because I'm just one person, you know, on, on just a dot on a piece of paper, basically, like, you know, everybody else, you know. But um, that has not been my personal experience, and I don't have not known that to be the experience of others, but I could be wrong, but definitely Christianity. We know they proselytize. They're going to go everywhere. Okay, and that is the religion of the West. Judeo-Christianity, now, Judaism, they don't go spread in their religion, okay? But a proselytizing their faith, their way of being, their culture, okay? But Christianity, sure enough, does, okay? And that is the religion of the West, okay? Again, that's part of the mindset. Spread your, your, your religion, spread your culture, spread your everything all over the damn world and dominate, okay? That is part of the Western thought, okay? Domination, okay? So much so we see that in our interpersonal relations, all right? But nevertheless, okay, proselytizing religions, okay? Um, and the specific Native cultures are undergoing revival, but few elements of the Native religions of those cultures remain unchanged from their earlier forms, all right? Um, Christianity brought since the 19th century by their missionaries, all right? 
uh, has replaced some beliefs and reshaped others. All right. Uh, it spread wide, Christianity spread widely in sub-Saharan Africa over the past 100 years, creating both mainstream, West, mainstream Western denominations and independent African churches. As a result, there are now more black members of the Anglican church than there are white members, but that's the point. Okay. Ain't no need to nobody sitting there. Now, understand when we talk about religion, it is not about, oh, I believe, I believe, you know, that faith has made me whole. Now, I'm saved and all that kind of thing. I know that is a part of the faith, okay, of the thought process, but it's more than that. It is about domination of a culture, uh, a culture dominating, you know, and taking, not just dominating, but eventually taking over. Okay, that's the role that religion plays as well. All right. Um. It, oh, okay, so maybe so, because it says Islam has also gained many converts in Africa. Okay, but we're gonna keep it going. Despite the threats of their existence, indigenous religions continue to thrive in several forms throughout the world. I want. I, I do want to say this real quick. So understand that when we talk about these quote unquote proselytizing religions, we're not talking about. Uh, 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 going around and it becoming, you know, uh, so widespread that um, necessarily that uh, each individual came up by the thousands and decided this is what they want. No, a lot of this is that was not by choice, but by what? By force. OK. And we know that. All right. OK. Um, historically, we know that, all right? And we'll get more into that as we go into the study of those proselytizing religions, all right? Despite the, and it, I mean, it wasn't just those that did that, though. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But those are going to be the focus, okay? Despite the threats of their, okay, I said that. In the purest form, they live on in those pockets where modern influence has penetrated the least. All right, uh, let's keep on going. Shamanism exists side by side with Buddhism in places like uh, Taiwan and Korea, Christianity and other religions. Indigenous religions have also intermixed with mainstream religions, okay? In the Caribbean, the gods of the African religions have sometimes been combined with forms of French and Spanish Catholicism in the religions of Voodoo or Vodun and Santeria, okay? Even here, okay? You know, where uh, these pagan religions, uh, Easter, I mean, pagan holidays, Easter, uh, Christmas, these are pagan, okay? Um, and But they were in, in mixed, okay? Some of the, you know, the practices of it and the belief of Christianity was mixed, okay, to get the people to actually concede to it and say, okay, yeah, we'll practice that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say it ain't always by no individual, you know, th you know, thousands of people coming for them talking about, I believe in this now. Hell no, that shit was forced on folk, okay? And how can we get these people to do this? Well, practice, you know, mix in some of their belief system, okay? And I said pagan, hopefully that wasn't offensive to anyone, but if it was, I apologize, okay? Slip of the tongue. But, you know, mix in their, their belief system, okay? Their cultural way of being, okay? With this, we trying to throw on them. How can we get Get them to do this, to dominate, okay, to take over their mind and their worldview, so on and so forth, so that eventually in time that you know their worldview can become our worldview. And here we have the, our culture has and religion and way of being <laughs> has dominated theirs. All right. Excuse me. All right. All right. All right. All right. That's it. That is it on the indigenous religions. Okay. Remember, this is all foundational. Next, we are going into Hinduism. I really, really enjoy Hinduism. I may take just a little bit of a break and have some lunch or something like that. And get into Hinduism. Now, with all of these that I'm doing, I want you to understand I'm not going, I'm just basically going into the founder, the origins, you know, uh, the basic tenets, basic belief system. Okay. Just, I'm, I'm doing it just like I did when I taught it in school. Okay. Because like I said, I have time to go through, you know, every single aspect of each one of these religions. It was just impossible. All right. So once again, it's just going to be. Um, no, I might get, cause see, look, I'm looking at the worship of the divine feminine or the De De Devi here 
in Hinduism, but I may not, okay? Just stick with what I did do. All right, all right. Y'all be blessed. Peace, like, share, and subscribe. I uh, appreciate it if you donate to the channel. Everything will be in the link below. Come on through. And tonight, me and Sunkiss are still on the ISIS papers. I believe we are on chapter, let me see. Tonight, we are reading chapter 10, okay? Ball games and symbols, the war of the balls, okay? All right, and um, that's it. Okay, check out my website, kenyattisintuition.com. Y'all be blessed. Peace.